Please be seated. Um, I just want to make sure we all understand the rules. Each side will have 15 minutes, but when it comes to the cross appellant, that means that 15 minutes goes in with the appellee's time as well. So you don't have an additional 15 minutes. You understand that, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Why don't we go ahead and begin then? Um, we'll begin with the appellant, and you may reserve up to five minutes. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Uh, may it please the court. My name is Steve O'Brien, and I'm here today representing Envision Waste Services, the appellant and also the cross appellee in this consolidated appeal. Uh, before proceeding, I would like to uh, reserve five minutes for rebuttal and basically state, though, that uh, I'm going to focus my uh, remarks on the on our appeal, uh, uh, get into the, uh, the county's uh, cross claims, perhaps, but I would like to. Uh, Reserve, or at least have the understanding that part of my rebuttal may be directed to the, uh, the cross claim issues of, of both parties. And of course, we'll be in rebuttal of theirs. Uh, if I may, I will begin discussing Envision's appeal, which seeks the reversal of the trial court's ruling, which erroneously found that the local governmental fees Envision paid on Medina's behalf were not reimbursable pass through costs. This ruling was clear here because under the plain and unambigu uh, unambiguous language of the contract, Medina promised, and I quote, all federal, state, and local fees associated with the operation of the facilities shall be considered as pass-through costs. All such costs shall be paid for by the county. And it's important to note as we proceed, this is the only section in this entire contract, section 2.6 that I just read to you, that speaks to the term of reimbursement for local fees. <clears throat> now I'm gonna to focus today basically on two main points uh, that support reversal. One, uh, the evidence and law is clear that uh, the local fees uh, at issue here are associated with the operation of the CPM. In fact, they are so in associated and intertwined with it, they are required to be paid for the legal operation of that facility. Secondly, local governmental fees are not a disposal cost, either as defined by the contract. As a matter of fact, the contract clearly states otherwise that disposal cost, that the local fees are not a disposal cost or included therein. Now, in, in upholding the trial court's uh, request for reimbursement, uh, Medina's request for reimbursement, the trial court, however, inexplicably found and erroneously found that only fees or expenses at or on the CPF are pass-through costs. In so ruling, this court violated uh, at least the three basic tenets of contract construction. First, by finding that only fees or expenses at or on the CPF uh, were pass-through costs, it in effect read out and made the entire pass-through cost provision that I just mentioned superfluous. Uh, because it was undisputed below and there are no local fees in existence or authorized that, they, that can be assessed at or on just the CPF itself. In effect, the trial court's ruling leads to a, the bizarre conclusion that the contract was written to apply to something that simply does not exist. Secondly, the court failed to give the effect to the plain meaning of the words used in the contract itself. It did not even discuss, much less, much less mention, the actual dictionary definition of associated with, which is to join together or things that join together or combine to uh, effectuate a common purpose. Here, the local fees that uh, Envision paid on uh, Medina's behalf to the local governments were combined with the state fee, and uh, they combined together, together with all the activities that are necessary to uh, properly and legally operate the CPF. So clearly, they are associated with this operation. And finally, as you know, a court is not permitted to uh, uh, ignore unambigu unambiguous terms in the contract uh, or, in effect, uh, substitute those words for additional words not used in the contract so as to rewrite it. Here, when the court uh, disregarded the plain meaning of uh, associated with and in instead inserted the words in the contract, only fees at or on the CPF, it blatantly erred. As I stated, the words associated with clearly mean or connote a combination of activities or fees that are joined together for a common purpose, in this case, to actually legally operate the CPF, not a singular fee, as the, uh, as the trial court found. What, what relevance does it have that um, you had the, uh, your company, representing your company, had the ability 
to take the waste products to whatever facility you wanted to, and that would determine what the fees were. Um, that's a good question, Your Honor. Uh, we had the initial uh, uh, discretion to suggest what landfill we would uh, propose to take the uh, to take the waste to, but the county had to approve it. So we did not have unilateral uh, uh, discretion to do that on our own. And uh, that is one of the reasons, uh, because the, the, the fee could uh, could be different depending upon what landfill you took, uh, you, you took the waste to. It was very important that the county had approval authority on that. So they knew at every, they knew what landfills we were taking uh, uh, the waste to, and they knew what the local, uh, local governmental charges were that they should be paying for at those landfills. We just had the initial, uh, bas basically, the, the, the suggestion as to where to take it. Um, but I did want to talk about the CPF and its legal oper uh, operation, and that ties right into it. Uh, the trial court here, I think, for whatever reason, perhaps misunderstood or didn't comprehend uh, the, the waste industry and the, and the, and the comprehensive fees uh, that, are, that are imposed by state statute, and indeed the state regulation that are imposed on the CPF. CPF to operate. It's allowed under the state law to uh, ex uh, accept waste and charge a significant uh, cost per ton to the waste haulers that bring the waste here to the CPF. But concomitant to, to that, they, uh, the CPF has to pay a state fee on all the waste that it accepts and recycles. And as a transfer station, it's a recycling center and a transfer station, it also had the liability to transport that waste from its uh, from its facility to a receiving landfill, wherever it might be located, however remote it, it may be from the landfill. But that, uh, the, uh, the county to operate the CPF also had the obligation to pay those local fees if there was a local fee imposed by a, a local solid waste district or a local community. Uh, pursuant to state law, uh, CPF couldn't operate if both the state and local fees were paid. And I think it's, uh, and, and, uh, the CPF couldn't operate either if end waste wasn't removed from the facility almost each and every day and taken to a landfill uh, because it would just back up and, and it couldn't operate because it would just be shut down. So given the state law and the practicalities of the situation, it is clear that the removal of end waste and the payment of local fees thereon it clearly, uh, is clearly associated with the operation of the facility. Indeed, it's legally mandated uh, to operate it. And the pass-through cost provision here only ensured that Medina would uh, continue that responsibility. And it certainly didn't shift that responsibility, as, as the county seemed to have suggested below, to, uh, to envision. In fact, the contract and the promise in the contract states otherwise. And lest there be any question that the uh, removal of end waste and the payment of local fees thereon uh, are associated with the operation of the facilities, both the former and the existing present sanitary engineer of Medina, uh, Medina County, on deposition conceded that the removal of end waste and the payment of local fees thereon at remote landfills are associated with the operation of the CPF. Now, interestingly, uh, the trial court's decision is so far uh, out of tune with the contract, it's interesting to note that even Medina County, uh, in their brief, don't agree with the trial court's ruling and don't support it. What they say, and I want to quote this because this is important, they say what the contract means is, the contract calls for reimbursement of local fees only when such local fees are associated with the operation of the facility. We agree. Then they say, to wit, that means when local fees are incurred and result from the operation of the CPF. Obviously, fees that result from is far more responsive, uh, expansive than the trial court's finding at on. But more importantly, we agree with Madonna's interpretation, and we believe it's a concession that the fees in question here are reimbursable and associated with the operation of the facility, because the fees here do, are incurred by the operation of the CPF, and they result from the, uh, uh, the end waste which it recycles, and then has the duty to ship to a receiving landfill. We think this is a very important concession, and you can find that on both pages 4 and 10 of, uh, of uh, Madonna's uh, reply brief in this court. Now, instead of supporting uh, the trial court's decision, Medina makes an argument in its papers uh, that the trial court really never found or made itself. It says that the local fees are not reimbursable 
because they are covered by a, a, the term disposal cost, which is found in another section of this contract under, and, uh, that's titled End Waste Removal. That section states that transportation and the, and the payment of disposal costs for end waste residue are the responsibility of the contractor. However, nowhere in the contract does it, does it define disposal costs to include the local fees that are mentioned, uh, that I mentioned in, in, the, in the section that I started with. Yeah. More importantly, their argument suggests that this later section can somehow trump or read out of the contract the past due cost provision that we talked about earlier, which certainly is not a proper construction, as this contract needs to be interpreted in par materia as our interpretation uh, would provide. We would pay the cost of transportation and the uh, landfill owner gate charge, they pay the local fees. Council, uh, you're in your rebuttal time already. Well, Your Honor, I would, I would just uh, state then that I would uh, uh, suggest that these, uh, these issues alone suggest that the trial court's decision uh, should be reversed. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, may it please the court. My name is Tom Karras, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney from Medina County, here on behalf of the Appellee Cross Appellant, uh, the Medina County, the so-called Medina County Defendants. Okay, we're here today on, on, on two matters, and I would ask to reserve uh, two minutes of, of, of uh, rebuttal time in the event that uh, in, in uh, the appellant's rebuttal that they discuss uh, uh, our claims. That's what I was trying to explain to you at the yes. beginning. We don't do that. We don't do rebuttal back and forth. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank That's you. okay. Thank you. Uh, we're here today, first of all, we, we, we would ask this court to affirm the trial court's judgment, which denied the vision's, the vision's motion for summary judgment, and in turn granted Medina's motion for summary judgment on uh, uh, plaintiff's complaint. Uh, and in turn, we are also here today asking for reversal of the trial court's judgment, which uh, which denied which denied our, our motion for summary judgment and uh, granted uh, granted the, uh, the appellant's motion for summary judgment on our counterclaims. Uh, Envision asserts in, in this appeal, actually, you know, Envision asserts in this appeal, first of all, that, it, that the contract is clear and unambiguous. But then it goes on to claim that, that indeed it, is, it should be construed as being ambiguous. And therefore, it's trying to introduce uh, additional evidence to try to break up that ambiguity. Well, what is it? You can't have it both ways. They can't have it that, that it's unambiguous and therefore uh, you only can look at the four corners of the, of the contract, or that it is ambiguous, and therefore uh, testimony, uh, supposed testimony from from uh, sanitary engineers must be considered. Um, it is our assertion that the contract is very clear and, is, and unambiguous, and that and that's what the trial court found. It found as in terms of the uh, the uh, plaintiffs the plaintiffs complaint. That it was it was clear and obvious. Now uh, you must look at the four corners of the contract, and the four corners of the contract includes includes a very important clause that 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 uh, that the plaintiff would love, would like this court to ignore, and that is that when it defines the, the uh, definition of what is end waste. End waste is very clearly is is put as the result of non-recoverable refuse material which has been processed both manually and mechanically through the CPS or, or material that was not processed through, through the CPS. Okay. And then the other section which makes that end waste definition very important is when it talks about uh, end waste residue discharge management. And in that section, it clearly says in the, in the, in the uh, relevant part, the cost of transportation and payment of all disposal costs of the end waste residue or recyclable material are the responsibility of the contractor. Well, certainly, this, this charge, that, that this disputed charge that we're supposedly we're supposed to be paying, is a charge that's made at a so-called gate charge. It's made 
at the disposal facility. And it, and it, is, it is related specifically to the amount of, of waste that is, that is disposed of. That's where it's charged, that's where it's paid. And, and uh, it's, it's clear, unambiguous. Now, uh, now, Judge Carr, you asked the question as to whether or not they had a, the, the, the uh, plaintiff selected the, the, the site. And it's correct, there is an approval, there is an approval that's done by the, by the county. But the reason for that approval is that um, uh, if you look at the contract, the uh, transportation equipment, the actual equipment, is owned by the county. And the, that, approval, that, that, approval was, that approval clause was put in there because they didn't want, the county did not want uh, the, their equipment to be used to dispose of, of, uh, of uh, end waste at, at facilities some hundred miles away, for instance, say down to Dayton, down to, to Columbus or whatever, uh, simply because that would be more wear and tear on their, on their equipment. There was never contemplated, and there's nowhere in this contract that says, well, you know, we, we, you know there might be a, a variation in this and the so-called disposal charges, as we, the, the county didn't care about disposal charges. If, you, if they want to go to somewhere that, that is more expensive, as opposed to one that didn't have this, this sort of fee, that, that was no effect on us because, because, the, uh, because of the end waste. Now, now the, most important, the most important clause in this contract in, in regards to this dispute is when they're saying, Costs, the the uh, pass through costs, which are the result of operation of the facility. Now there is a fee, there is a state fee, and that is that is specifically associated with the amount of end waste or the amount of waste that comes into the facility. That's a state fee, and certainly. What the, do you mean it's associated with? It's associated. It, it, it's based upon. The amount of waste that is that is brought to the facility. Okay, so for instance, uh, uh, they, they they did approximately, I believe, about 125,000 tons of waste came into the facility each year. Of that 125,000 tons, a fee has to be paid, and I believe it was it was just under uh, five dollars per ton, four seventy-five. That, that fee was paid, and that's what was contemplated by the pass-through cost, was the fee that was paid at the facility. Now, of that 125,000 tons, there are approximately, I believe, around, at, at the minimum, about 13% was extracted either as recyclables or uh, was uh, composted and, and never ended up in, in the landfill facility. So. So, when when that when that when that when that waste goes to the landfill facility, it's minus that 13 percent, and then, and it's only on that is what that fee is paid, the local fee that they're they're seeking reimbursement for. It's only on the waste that ends up there. That's a disposal cost. Now, when they talk about operating the facility. This facility was not a waste facility. It wasn't a landfill. It was, it, it was simply a recycling facility. The process was the waste is brought in from the county. It is, uh, and all, the rec all recyclable material was, the theory was that all recyclable material would be extracted and then would be sold on the open market. And then the remaining would then go to a landfill. The reason that they did that was, at the time when this was, was contemplated, they were looking to try to reduce what ended up in the landfill. The, the, from, the, from a government standpoint, that's what the purpose of this was, was to reduce the amount of waste ending up in the landfill. And, the, and this was a way that they thought would be economically uh, feasible to try to reduce those landfill costs. Um, but, but uh, for, for, 
For them to come here and say that the contract clearly, clearly calls for uh, payment of this, extracting out this, this pass-through cost, the only way that you could come to that conclusion, and the court was correct when they, when they did, the only way you could come to the conclusion that this is a responsibility of the, of the county is to ignore that, uh, that clause which said uh, costs associated with operation of the facility. It's not a landfill. It's not a waste, it's not a waste disposal facility. It's a recycling facility. And those costs are associated, the cost, the state fee, the amount of waste that's coming in is part of the operation. The amount of waste that's going out is not part of the operation. It's not part of the operation. Does it say that in the contract? Yeah, it, it clearly says that. It says, it, it describes, like I said, it describes that. But that does it say that the, um, the waste going out of the facility is not part of the facility? Because the waste coming in is obviously part of the facility. Yeah, it, it has to be because, because because that's how you extract the recycling. Right, but the problem is, isn't it, that you can't leave the waste there. You have to dispose of it. Well. So the, why would that not be part of the operation? But, but that would be the same whether that would be the same whether or not it, you know, it, 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 it acted as a, a as a transfer station, which would merely say that you accumulate all the waste and then you take it and then you <laughs> take it to the facility. That would that would. I don't want to take up more of your time. I don't. You only have like two and a half minutes. I don't okay. Know. Okay. I, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. But, but no. The the key the key phrase just to, to just to reiterate, the key clause in here is is first of all the definition of end waste, and second of all the clause which says that all costs associated with disposal of end waste are those. Uh, are those responsible from the uh, the um, the plan? Okay. Now, as to as to uh, the the county's counterclaims, there are two, and I won't spend a lot of time on the blue bag. But I think the most important of the counterclaims is there is a clause here. It is absolutely clear and unambiguous. And that clause is that the contractor shall be responsible for maintaining the, maintaining the facility and to make any repairs or replacements in order to keep the facility and retain the facility in the same condition as which it was received. Okay, now we, we, we were able to show that among other things, just as it would be analogous to uh, 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 a lease, and where the uh, tenant, upon leaving the premises, has to leave the property in the, in the condition. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the damage that had occurred, that which, which it's very clear that, uh, that the uh, defendant or the plaintiff was responsible for, was, uh, was not apparent until after they had vacated the facility. Okay, but then there was other, there's other things. And there's been a lot of time, we had, we had depositions, and there's been a lot of time talking about combustible dust. And combustible dust is, is merely dust that can, can, can cause a fire. And in fact, uh, sometime, I believe during the year prior to they came to the premise at the end of the contract, uh, there was an inspection by the uh, uh, Bureau of Workers' Comp, and plaintiff was was, was uh, involved in that inspection. The county was involved in that inspection, and they did identify that there was a, a, a dangerous accumulation of dust. Well, that's clearly in the in the in the maintenance clause of the contract. That clearly was a responsibility of, of uh, the the uh, uh, contractor to clean that. And uh, then, when they vacated the premises, that kind of, that, that they, they discovered that that wasn't cleaned at all. Well, when they went to when they went and got quotes as to what it would cost, it was it was a significant amount of money to to uh, correct that. And that was something that that even the Bureau of Workers' Comp was saying, hey, this is a danger to people, and this may and they may this may cause the premiums to go up because. 
because you're, uh, you're, you're operating a dangerous facility. There could be a fire throughout the thing. It's combustible dust. There's nothing, there's nothing in the contract that talks about combustible dust. But there is, there is, there is parts in the contract where we talk about maintaining the, maintaining the premises in a clean and cleanliness. And, and there's, there has to be cleanliness. And then there's also, there's also the clause, as I quoted, that says that, that it should be left in the same condition that it was, that it was, uh, uh, um, that it was received. Well, there was other damages. There was other damages besides the combustible dust. There were damages to the floor. There was damages to the doors. And, there, and those, those were expenses. And I think the court erred because it didn't, it, it didn't really acknowledge that, that this clause, that, there, that, that the, the plaintiff actually had this, re, this, this responsibility to clean, to clean the combustible dust. And to, and to correct the, the uh, broken floor. And the, these, were, these were things that weren't even discovered until after they, they had vacated the facility. So, so uh, we think that the court erred. And at the very least, we didn't ask the court to determine what the amount of the damages were, though we did show evidence of that. But, but, but we, we, were merely, we were merely asking the court in our motion to find that, indeed, that the plaintiff did have responsibility, and then we would have the, the hearing to determine what the actual damages were. Thank you, Captain. You're out Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, just on the last point, uh, let me point out that the uh, motion that was filed below by uh, Medina was a straight motion for summary judgment claiming that uh, we breached the contract and we had the duty and had to prove damages. And the trial court so found. Matter of fact, they found uh, they didn't prove any causation. That uh, on, on the counterclaims, the trial court found across the board that nothing in the contract required uh, Envision to do any of the things about which the county complained of. And it said they failed to show any causation that Envision did anything to cause any damage. And it also found that they failed to prove any legally recognizable damages. Now, Mr. Kerr stands up here and says, oh, he really meant to file a motion for partial summary judgment. Well, you can't have a second bite of the apple. Uh, secondly, let me just say as to the allegation that uh, they discovered the fact that the tip floor insulation overhead doors uh, needed to be repaired after the contract was over, there was clear and convincing evidence. These were issues that had worn out at the CPF. These were issues that the county knew they had to replace as a capital item and there was clear and convincing evidence that the county put the cost of repair of all those items, they knew about them, they knew they needed to repair, in their capital budgets that they published to the public. So the, as, to the, as to the counterclaims, the trial court was clear. Uh, we, we set forth very clearly in our briefing that uh, the trial court was right. Nothing in these contracts requires, uh, required anything that, they, that, that, that Medina uh, is, uh, is arguing about. These were all after the fact retaliatory claim that they never raised with uh, Envision during the term of the contract. And as we stated there, there was a dispute resolution clause. The solid waste coordinator was the, who lives on the who has an office on the premises, uh, was to direct us and tell us if there was any problem that needed to be rectified or clarified. There was no evidence that they ever gave us a determination that we ever did anything that they deemed to be a breach of this contract. But. Uh, so as the, I think that pretty much sum, uh, wraps up. The court was clearly correct in, in, in granting our well-documented, extensive motion for summary judgment on these uh, retaliatory counterclaims. But I wanted to get back to the uh, to the point on our appeal, Judge Carr, and your question, uh, which was uh, right on. Uh, the and it, it, as you suggested, the removal of end waste and the taking of that end waste to a landfill is part of the operation of the CPF. It is, a, uh, these are uh, activities that are associated with its operation. And while Mr. Harris suggests that it's a recycling center, it is a Ohio State licensed recycling and transfer station because it accepts waste with the responsibility to get rid of it. Thus clearly, the removal of this end waste and the payment of the local fees thereon are clearly associated with, uh, with, with the operation of the facility as a recycling center and transfer station. And 
uh, you notice he didn't t att attempt to disavow the testimony of, of both of the officials that know the technical terms, that know the law, the sanitary engineers themselves. But that would only come in if the, if the actual term in the contract or the clause in the contract is ambiguous. Well, Otherwise, they, they don't need it. They, relied, they relied on the sanitary engineer's original determination, which he basically disavowed on deposition. And I believe, since we're dealing with technical terms, that that, uh, that, that uh, can be uh, the fact that the, uh, their interpretation of that language can be taken into consideration here. Uh, well, to Judge Carr's point, um, because I had the very same question, this court's place once again with two sides arguing that this contract is, is patently clear and unambiguous, <coughs> as the trial court found, but opposite results. And so, since, since it's a summary judgment, it would have to be unambiguous, would it not? Or we'd have to look to the outside of the contract for testimony of the sanitary engineer or others as to what it meant to say. Um, again, I think you, uh, our position is that the, the contract is clear and unambiguous. And we only suggest that uh, uh, because uh, both the trial court cites the sanitary engineer's opinion in a letter in his decision, and uh, Medina cites the sanitary engineer's testimony in their brief, we point out that on deposition, they both disavowed the, the, their earlier testimony. Uh, we did suggest, as, as, as Mr. Karras indicates, that uh, this contract uh, and the trial court's ruling thereon is so uh, far afield of the plain meaning and the rules that I stated uh, originally that at best it could be deemed to be ambiguous, and that would be because it's undisputed that they drafted it would be construed against them. As an all the I don't mean to stand in the way, way of uh, lunch. <laughs> no, no, Am I out of time? You're fine. We just have to, uh, you know, apply the rules, uh, uh, you know, fairly. Anyway, yes, you're out of time. And uh, the court will take the matter under advisement, issue a written opinion that will be sent to both sides, as well as being released on our website and the Supreme Court website electronically.